Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we're actually going to start church already, and it's only, yeah, we've got two minutes to go, but we have our ecumen here today, and um, we are so excited. We're one out of four stops this morning. So this is the quick announcement for anybody who's in the hall or in the friendship room. Come on in. We're getting the show started here. So please join me in welcoming the ecumen today. Thank you. 
our second song, and then we go running off. But uh, rejoice and sing Noel. Sorry to sing and run. Thank you for having me. <laughs>
expectation, the fulfillment of your promise to come to us and shine your eternal light. Amen. Let us together confess our sin. God of hope, we come to you in the midst of a world fought with troubles. Although the darkness is powerful, open our eyes, Lord, to the light of your presence. Give us faith to stand against the voices of division and violence. Through your Spirit, remake us into hope-filled disciples, discovering lives attuned to your wonder and sparking in others a desire to know you more. Give us courage and strength to change our lives that your peace may become a reality in this world right now, this day. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today we remind ourselves of God's ancient promise. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and a little child shall lead them. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On the second Sunday of Advent, we choose to look for signs of God at work in our lives and in our world right now. So today we light this second candle and call it peace. Amen. I invite you this time to turn to your neighbor and give them a passing of peace and more welcome. Generously to that. 
Um, I know Karen wants to quick make an announcement again about the, the envelope, so I'm going to have Karen come up. The offering envelopes for 2024 can be found out in the hallway by the patio doors. And uh, there's also a sheet of paper there in the event that you no longer want to use the envelopes. Just put your name on there. And uh, if you find that your envelopes aren't there, put your name on there as well. And just say that I want envelopes uh, because some people who may have indicated last year that you don't want the envelopes may have changed your mind. Thank you. Last week um, we mentioned that Jessica was going to be heading to Pittsburgh for a, a very um, intense surgery and we have got word that the surgery went very well. Um, the doctor is very pleased with, with the outcome of the surgery and he said that he didn't see why she shouldn't make it home for Christmas. So um, praise the Lord for, for Jessica's successful surgery. Uh, we do have, we do have a card. We forgot to get, okay. Um, we're going to make sure a card is out there that we can sign um, in between services that we can mail off to Jessica. Um, we've got her address in Pittsburgh. If anybody wants to send their own personal greeting, um, just let me know and I can email you the address as well. But certainly continued prayers for Jessica, for her family, um, and just for a full recovery with that. Um, I also want to mention that Peggy Kay is going to be having surgery on her back this Tuesday, so we want to keep Peggy in our prayers. Uh, Dave Wolf was hospitalized this past, or in the ER this past week, so we want to keep Dave and Kathy in our prayers, and certainly continue prayers for Larry Wheelock as um, he battles COVID, and of course prayers for Terry Christie, for Ed Mulling, and for Pastor Rich, who is really coming down on stretch here with his recovery. Flowers on the altar today are from Al and Kathy Olson in, remember, in memory of Al's mother, Carmen Olson, and we want to thank Marlene again for her offering Ministry of Music today. Fellowship Hour treats are from Mona and Jim, as well as some uh, abundance of goodies that were left from last night, so uh, we're sure to have a good spread out there today. And then birthdays. Today we have Penny Elliott and Robert Hammond, and then throughout the course of the week we have Sue Calhoun, Noah Kay, Bob Patton, Claire Gustafson, Jenna Lusty, J uh, Jerry Cook, and Oma Kohler. So please join me in singing. Happy birthday to you. I'm reading it from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 2 to 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shined. You have multiplied exaltation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, and as the joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, they have broken as on the day of Midian. For all boots are of the trampling, tramping warriors, and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests on his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Great will be his authority, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and upon it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
gospel reading this morning, you'll hear the words of Jesus and you'll hear him, hear him make reference to the passage that Kent just read for us. I want to invite you to stand if you're able for this reading from the gospel. We'll follow this with hymn number 110, or for a thousand times, hymn number 110. But hear the word of the Lord. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, and the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
probably not the song you were expecting. That'd be my guess. Those who are familiar with the Messiah probably think that I would have highlighted this song, which is much more joyful. Uh, without the dirge and despair of the first song. In fact, that's my only point here this morning, that the light does not have nearly the significance it ought to have unless for a moment we focus on the fact that there is a deep and enveloping darkness that can be overwhelming, that can be overpowering, can be so, so oppressive to us that we need just a small glimmer of hope that there might be a light that there might be a gift, that there might be something more. And it's because of that that I would suggest that there are two kinds of people during this particular season in the Christian year. You know them and you know which side you lean on. There are people who lean hard into Advent and they enter into its longing and its waiting and its yearning for light in the midst of darkness because they just totally get into the fact that you've got to wait, you've got to wait, you've got to wait. And because of that, they sometimes can be very, very difficult to live with because they do not want Christmas to happen till December 25th. Now, that's one type of person, and most people aren't like that. Then you have the whole other side that want to skip Advent altogether, jump right to the sparkle and the decorations and the lights and the happiness and the joy, and forget that there ever is this season that is a season of longing, a season of darkness, a season of waiting. We do a messy mix of both of them here at Emmanuel. We have a Christmas tree up. That really shouldn't be up until December 25th. These are Advent candles. That is, those are what belong to this season right now. And yet we have to do a messy mix of both because in our world, pretty much right after Thanksgiving, if not before Thanksgiving, we're already in full Christmas mode. We also try very hard for first service particularly to have no Christmas songs uh, until December 24th, which is still not Christmas. But since we don't have a Christmas service, we have to mess it up and mix it up just a little bit and celebrate Christ's birth before Christmas actually really comes. So that can be very difficult to experience for those who are either hardcore Adventists or those who are hardcore Christmas people. Because the hardcore Christmas people want joy and celebration and lights and sparkle and decorations from Thanksgiving forward. And those who are Advent people don't want to see a hint of those things until December 25th. So what do you do in a world like that? Well, what you do is you do what we do. You do this messy mix because we're all doing our best to worship God as best we're able. And we do our best to try to understand what the season of Advent is supposed to represent after all. Because it really is supposed to be this time of longing, this time of yearning, this time of waiting in the dark. And that's the point in our Isaiah passage. Advent always begins in the dark. And the light can be a chief comfort, a chief comfort and just a sentiment unless we embrace the darkness. For us, Advent happens in the dark. You all experience, just like I do, how it's night earlier and earlier every day, and, and it's just darker and darker as we move into this season. Israel experienced this darkness, but it was much more profound. The people who walked in darkness 
They've seen a great light, and the people walked in the darkness, meaning they felt it. It, it was oppressive. It was a weight on their shoulders, a heavy burden, because it was so profoundly uh, real and visceral. And that's because at the time Isaiah writes this, there is a great superpower to the north, Assyria, that has already conquered Israel. Israel has been taken away into captivity. So all that is left is the southern kingdom of Judah, this small little southern kingdom whose border is being threatened by this Assyrian superpower. And they are threatened. They are living in the dark. As far as they know, there's not much time left for them as a nation. Meanwhile, in their own nation, they have King Ahaz. And if you don't know who King Ahaz was, that's all right. Just know that he was one of the worst kings that Judah ever had. He put idols into the temple. He killed his own son, slaughtered him as a sacrifice for Baal, uh, a pagan god. He was a bad guy. So they had bad leadership. They had threatening times. Their borders were threatened. Uh, their lives were threatened. It's these dark times that Isaiah points out in order to share a message of hope. We also live in dark times. We live in times where we can feel the oppression, the weight uh, of war and violence and hatred. Uh, we live in a time where we all know one of the biggest times for depression and despair is during the Christmas seasons. Uh, during Thanksgiving and Christmas particularly, that's when a lot of people feel the weight and the burden uh, in the midst of all of these wonderful times. So unless we have our head in the sand, we all know what it's like to feel that collective weight of darkness and also the personal darkness that sometimes we have to go through. And that's why I find it wonderful that the prophets never sugarcoat a situation. The prophets are always deadly serious about what life is really like. And for the prophets, particularly Isaiah here, but all of them, darkness is very real and it must be acknowledged. And it's only against the backdrop of that darkness that the hope of the light shines forth. And that's the message here. Isaiah says, you all are living in darkness, in deep darkness. But because of that, you can appreciate something, that in the midst of this utter blackness, this despair, this oppressive way, a light is shining. And that light is shining in such a way that there's hope, because God's going to multiply joy again. Just like it's in the time of harvest, when you know all the crops are in and you're safe for another season. Or just as in a time when war is over and people are dividing plunder and, and oppressive yokes and burdens are being pushed away and all the garments of, of violence and hatred are being burned in the fire. And he says, there's going to be joy again and that joy, that release, that light that's shining is going to come from one source. And this is where the text moves into our song from Handel. He says, unto you, a child is going to be born. A son is going to be given. This hope is going to come from a small child. And this child will have these qualities that are exceedingly superlative. I mean, this is the highest praise that Isaiah can offer when he says his name will be Wonderful Counselor meaning he is this wonder-working counselor. He's able to come up with a plan and implement and execute it in a way that is so much better than foolish and evil Ahaz, who is doing all kinds of horrible things. Instead, he's going to come with wisdom. He's going to come with the strength of mighty God, being a representative of God's power. He will come as the everlasting father, which is the way to say, just as a good parent cares for the weak and the vulnerable, the one who is coming is going to care for those who are weak and downtrodden. And he will come bringing peace as the Prince of Peace. And his authority, since this isn't just a message for personal comfort, this is a message for all the world. The authority will be as such that there will be endless peace, the throne of David established, and justice and righteousness will be present from that time onward and forevermore. So you have this light. And it's a light that shines about this superlative leader who is going to come and bring in a reign of justice and peace. And it's a beautiful message, and it's why that song, For Unto Us a Child Was Born, is such a wonderful song. It, it, it captures that joy, it captures that, that happiness that finally life has arrived. And yet, it's interesting, when you think about how this passage is fulfilled, 
if you are completely specific to just Isaiah's prophecy, the fulfillment of Isaiah's word is not Jesus, it is Hezekiah. For Hezekiah is the child that is born to Ahaz. And Hezekiah is one of those apples that falls far away from the tree. Because Hezekiah is a reforming king. He brings back temple worship. He takes the idols out of the temple. He brings back uh, morality and righteousness. And yet there is a sense in which when you look at Hezekiah for all of his reforms, he doesn't completely and utterly fulfill this, if for no other reason, because his kingdom is not everlasting. And the peace and justice do not continue on and on, which makes it so that this prophecy is like so many. It has multiple fulfillments, and its ultimate fulfillment is going to be found in the coming of the Christ child. In that message that the angels say, as they say that, behold, the child is given, and joy and wonder now abound. You heard in Jesus, we read in Matthew chapter 4, and the reason I read it is Jesus himself sees himself as the fulfillment of this prophecy. He quotes from Isaiah 9, and he says, this has been fulfilled, and he then begins to pronounce his gospel message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He himself is the one who says, for God so loved the world that God gave the beloved son that all who believe might not perish. And so there's this gift of the child, the gift of the son, the gift that is Jesus. And it's a gift that's wonderful. It's a gift that we celebrate. It's a gift that we point our eyes toward every Sunday as we seek to walk in the way of Christ and to know what it means to live in the presence of the resurrected Christ. But here's what's interesting to me. Even as we walk in that light, we know that darkness remains. It's not like the darkness is ever over. In fact, Jesus' story itself involves a lot of darkness. Immediately after he's born, King Herod decides he's going to slaughter a whole village of children in order to eliminate the king of the Jews. We know that throughout Jesus' life, he experienced conflict and betrayal and ultimately rejection and torture and death. So that Jesus, who is the light, is enshrouded by and surrounded by a darkness that must be dealt with that can't be sung away, that can't be joyed away. It is something that is pervasive and something that he needs to deal with. That's why he's rejected. He does not counter the darkness with the darkness or the violence with violence or the hatred with hate. Instead, he gives himself in self-giving love in the sacrifice of the cross, which is why I think it's interesting that Advent and Christmas really always have to be a muddled mix. Because, yes, we celebrate the decoration of the sparkle and the light and the shining, but it's never apart from the darkness. That darkness is pervasive. It still remains. And yet, at the same time, if we just focus on the darkness, we lose any possible hope that comes from knowing that it's in and from the darkness that the light shines. So we can't be overly precise. There's a little bit of Christmas in Advent. Because there's always the hope of a light that's shining. And there's a little bit of Advent in Christmas because there's still a yearning for justice. There's still a waiting and a longing. There's still an awareness that there is a darkness that is so profound if we don't keep our eyes on the light and the hope that is the light that we will lose our bearings. That's why to me, people who skip Advent and move right to Christmas are like people who skip right to Easter and forget Good Friday. And they sing on Easter morning, Christ the Lord is risen today. And I always wonder, what does that mean if you haven't been through that holy week of betrayal and, and, and crucifixion and, and torture and loss and sorrow? What does it mean? Are we just celebrating the victory without knowing? Like we can't sing Christ the Lord is risen today unless we're willing to sing, O sacred head, now wounded any more than we can't sing, for unto us a child is born, unless we're willing to sing, for the people who dwell in deep darkness have seen ye now great light, unless we're willing to admit that that darkness is real, and the good news is always that the darkness never has the final word. That's the prophetic message. They're realistic enough to point to the darkness, acknowledge it, understand its power, and understand its oppression, and yet to say, in the midst of that darkness, indeed from that darkness, 
A great light is erupting, a light that will bring an end to injustice and violence and death. Which is to say, to cherish the dark, to cherish the light, we must acknowledge that darkness. There's only so many responses you can have to darkness. Uh, you can deny it. You can put your head in the sand, and, and, and we can do that. You can just turn off the news, you can turn off uh, any kind of acknowledgement of all that's going on around us. You can kind of shut your eyes to the need in our community. Uh, you can do your best to just put your head in the sand and just try to wish it away. The problem is that doesn't work because it doesn't go away. So you can deny it, you can curse it, you know, curse the darkness, but you know what that does? It just adds more darkness to darkness. You're not helping anybody, you're not helping yourself. You can capitulate to it, which is to say, I guess darkness is the way things are, and I just need to align myself with it. I need to have the same hate and the same violence and the same injustice because, you know, uh, only the fat cats know how to really live. So you can deny it, you can curse it, you can capitulate it, or you can counter it, which is what Jesus does. He counters the darkness. He shines a light in a dark world, the light of God's love, the light of God's grace, the light of God's justice, and indeed that causes the darkness to fall upon him in such a way that the cross becomes the only end to that. But thank God, even in the darkness of death, a light shines. For that light is God's love, which is greater than even death, raising our Lord uh, to life. Now see, I'm moving even into Easter. Because really, in order to understand the Christian message, we've got to muddle and mix the seasons all the time. I mean, we, we, we can't talk about the cross and just stop there. We have to go to Easter. Just like we can't just talk about darkness and longing and yearning without talking about the answer to our yearning and longing and waiting and to speak of how this light shines in the midst of the darkness. And that's why I want to encourage you this Advent season. No matter where you're at on that spectrum, if you're a full Advent person or you're a full Christmas person, maybe it'd be good this year to be a muddled mix. Muddled mixes are always fun to be. Maybe it'd be good to just sit there and think, you know, I am grateful for the joy and the sparkle and the decorations and the happiness and, and the drawing attention to the importance of family and, and of peace and of light and of love. And yet at the same time, I know that that doesn't matter for much unless I acknowledge that those things shine out of the depths of a darkness that sometimes is overpowering, is sometimes overwhelming if I have my eyes open. Because I can't curse it, and I don't want to capitulate to it, and I don't want to deny it. I want to counter it. And so how do I counter it? Well, I acknowledge, like the prophets do, that darkness is real, and it's oppressive and weighty, and sometimes you can just feel it. You're walking in it. It's like this, this, this sl sludge that's around you. It's just hard to even take one step forward. And yet, in the midst of even that deep darkness that the prophet talks about, darkness never has the final word. Because light shines in our collective and personal darknesses. Light shines in such a way that the promise of God is this. For unto us, you and I, a child is born. A son is given. And his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And he will establish his reign in such a way that it will be everlasting and no darkness, no evil, no injustice can ever thwart it. Yes, darkness does its best against him, but, but in the end, the light reigns. When you've seen that light, my hope is that it will give you this sense of courage and strength and joy to know that the darkness is never the final word. And may that hope give you strength to do what is our mission statement together to shine the light of God's love in the world because we don't want to curse the darkness. It just doesn't get us anywhere. We certainly don't want to capitulate to it, and yet that's easy enough, and sometimes we do that without even recognizing it. What we want to do is counter it in the best way we can, and that is to look at the light and allow our lives to be even just a small reflection of that light into this world so that we might shine our light, the light of God's love, into this broken and dark world.
Give just a moment for reflection, and then we're going to have a responsive prayer to this great promise that's given to us in Isaiah.
We pray for Peggy Kay's upcoming surgery. We ask for your presence in that, your strength and success and recovery. And we pray for Dave Wolf, Terry Christie, Ed Mewing, <clears throat> excuse me, Ed Mewing, uh, as they continue to deal with uh, different ailments. We pray for all of them that they know your strength, your peace, that we all would see your light. And then we pray for those who haven't been mentioned, people close to us, colleagues, friends, family, those we love, those we care for. We lift them into your presence and we ask, oh Lord, bring peace, bring light, bring hope, bring grace. Finally, we thank you for the gifts given in the giving church and pray you bless the gifts and the giver as together we pray boldly with all the saints for you are risen, Lord, you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. For our final song, I invite you to turn to hymn number 185, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. I invite you to stand, period. Mm -hmm. 